This is supposed to be the 80th and the 80th anniversary, not just of Pearl Harbor, but the 80th anniversary of the start of the Pacific War. Or, or some people will say, many historians and many people on in East Asia will say, actually, Second World War did not begin. At Second World War in Asia did not begin December 7, but may have begun as early as 1937 when Japan invaded mainland China itself, or as early as 1931, when Japan invaded Manchuria, right? But for purposes of this lecture, this is World War II in the Philippines, how it began, and what was the course of the war here for the first six months, okay? Darkest Before the Dawn is actually part of a coat by an American serviceman who was based in Mindanao, and shortly before the surrender of the last Americans in May of 1942, sent out the message to his wife. Now he typed out, he sent out a message to his wife in California saying, it is always darkest before the dawn, before he walked out of the base and joined the guerrillas in the mountains, right? Yeah, let's begin. When you use the word World War II, it's actually important to understand that the term World War II only, only was used when World War II itself began. Obviously, you cannot have a World War II unless you had a World War I. But even the term World War I was not coined until World War II itself began. Now, in history, in 1914, when the war broke out in Europe, they called it the Great War in the beginning. And towards the end of it, when when the casualties had mounted to something like 10 million military casualties, they renamed it not the Great War, but rather the war to end all wars. But we know very well that the war to end all wars did not obviously end all wars. Actually, what was supposed to be so terrible a conflict to convince people not to fight anymore, not to go to war anymore, there were so many seeds for future conflict after World War I. So many people who were unhappy, and incredibly, the unhappy people include both winners and losers, that the global turmoil was so strong that it was really only a matter of time before another global conflict would erupt, with people changing sides, with people saying, I felt that I was cheated, with people saying I, the results were unfair, and so forth and so on, okay? In fact, in the... Uh, in the 15 years or so when I was teaching Western history, I would say that the period between World War I and World War II was not really a time of peace, but more of a, ta a time out, an, inter an intermission, or in some cases, a swapping of teams, swapping of players before the real act. Kumaga, World War I was the front act in World War II, the real act, okay? the real first truly global war. But not just the end of World War I did not just create a lot of turmoil, a lot of insecurity, a lot of anger and frustration. After maybe the first 10 years of World War I, there seemed to be a bubble of peace. No? Uh, after the initial anger seemed to have disappeared, and I do emphasize the word seemed to disappear, there was this bubble of peace which burst during the Great Depression of 1929. In other words, for many people who thought briefly or felt or had this word delusional and thought that, okay, maybe there really will be some peace. The Great Depression, where in practically every country in the world was affected not economically, but socially and politically, the Great Depression reawakened or worsened or heightened what were already a lot of sore points. You know? So a lot of the, de the democracies became even more unstable, or the Great Depression gave opportunities to people like Hitler to come to power for the next two years. We're saying democracy fails, capitalism fails, and so forth and so on. Let me show you a slide now of how people felt after World War I. This slide here shows you what's called America first. After World War I, the United States, or our colonial master, between uh, the, the first half of the 20th century, the United States, which had joined World War I, its first real global commitment, was so traumatized that they were saying, we don't want to join more war. We want to 
hide behind our great barriers from invasion, ergo the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. And the Americans were saying, we will no longer get involved in any more conflict. American blood will not be shed any longer. And the consequence to that meant America began cutting its military budget and America was no longer interested in really providing a strong military defense for us, its colonial entity in Southeast Asia. Okay? So what does that mean? It meant that even if the United States had already planned, even for World War I, it's very important, huh? even for World War I, American military planners had already designed a contingency plan. What if we were to go to war with Japan? No? So even for World War I, in the, in the halls of, well, the Pentagon did not exist at that time, but in the halls of military, American military headquarters, they're already aware that perhaps one day our biggest enemy will be Japan. So they already made, even for World War I, what's called War Plan Orange. In other words, they knew that in case they were going to go to war, this is the plan. War Plan Orange, or more specifically, WPO, WPO3, or version 3. WPO3 said, in case of invasion by Japan, American and Philippine force were to retreat to Bataan and to Corredor, and there await, hold out for six months, stockpile for six months, and prepare for to hold on and just wait for reinforcements. So this was before World War I. But World War I was going to twist WPO. What are we talking about? See, after World War I, if the assumption was, in case of war with Japan, the American Pacific fleet would simply steam over from Hawaii, from Pearl Harbor to the Philippines, something changed along the, along the way. What is that? See, after World War I, Japan acquired a number of islands. Huh? Uh, let, let me jump it ahead here. If you look at this slide here, you will see that in the lower right-hand corner, Japan had acquired quite a number of islands, formerly German. Remember in World War I, Japan was on the Allied side. So they had fought alongside the British, the French, and the Americans. And as part of their reward no, for being on the winner's side, they had acquired these islands. This is after World War I. Remember, WPO3 assumes that there will be the American fleet could unopposedly come from Hawaii to Manila. But World War I, see, these islands, the Marianas Islands, except for Guam, and the Carolyn Islands, Palau, the Marshall Islands, all of these had now become Japanese air and naval bases. Translate, a barrier for any American ships and troops would come to us. But the Americans in their wisdom insisted, no, 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 WPO can still work. WPO can still be done. Even if in the process, the Americans could not quite believe or could not quite accept Japan's growing military might. This particular picture shows the Russo-Japanese War. Actually, if you look closely, these are not the same Japanese uniforms of the 19th century. These are now Western style uniforms, Western trained Japanese who defeated the Russians in the fight over Port Arthur. So these are now very disciplined, very modernized Japanese soldiers, right? And here's another picture. So you can see again, the Japanese military in Western style outfit and trained in Western style strategy, and yet retain the st same strong feeling of Bushido in the willingness to die. But Americans in the Philippines, and I guess the American military as a whole said, no, we can handle the Japanese. If it comes to war, we can take them, okay? With a strong delusion, let's not worry about it. So when Japan began its expansion, driven by population, uh, by a growing population, driven by a lack of resources, driven by a lack of space, and driven by a feeling of ultranationalism. When Japan invaded Manchuria in 1931, the League of Nations or the Four United Nations, it was not able to stop Japan. So even when the League of Nations ordered Japan to withdraw from Manchuria, the Japanese simply said, okay, we quit, end of it. 
we will no longer join your group. And when Japan invaded China in 1937, even despite any direction from their own government, in other words, it was just built there on its own, when Japan invaded China, took its major ports, <coughs> took the Great Wall, many Westerners still said, no, this is Japan. We don't have to worry about them. They're Japan. We don't have to worry about their military. It's the, the refusal to believe that they are now at the very least at par with Western armies. So even when Japan, for example, uh, when Japanese military did what's called the Rape of Nanking or Nanjing, 1937, and tens of thousands of Chinese are massacred, Japan's condemned for what they have done. And yet Western military experts, and I guess the ordinary Westerners still could not believe that Japan was a modern military power, okay? And when Japan finally allied with the Germany, with Germany and Italy to form the Axis, even then, most people said, okay, they have allied with Germany, Italy, but even that is nothing to really worry about. Okay, the tripartite pact is nothing to really worry about. Okay, when Manuel Quezon brought in Douglas MacArthur to run the Philippine Army, MacArthur had already retired from the, from the U.S. Army, and Quezon promoted him to field marshal and gave him a truly massive income more than any American officer at that time, and gave him a seven-room suite, air-conditioned, at the Pentos Manila Hotel. MacArthur told Quezon, even if we don't have too much money, we can, when he said we, meaning him and the Philippine army, can protect the Philippines on its own. See, when the Philippines gained communal status in 1935, there were 10 years where in the Philippine government was supposed to prepare for independence, right? So many Filipino politicians, they were saying, we have to prepare for independence. But the problem with many Filipino politicians, the definition of preparing for independence is more of who will be president in 1945? Who will run the show? So for many politicians, it was more of a power play. Many Filipinos felt military preparation, not a priority. Kaya nga, there was not enough budget for defense funds. In fact, even if Quezon did put the National Defense Act as the first act under the Commonwealth, there still wasn't enough money. It was, although to be fair, it wasn't that they didn't, couldn't put enough money. The really fact, major fact was there wasn't enough money to put in to begin with. But here's Douglas MacArthur, the American Caesar. Douglas MacArthur said, I can train the Filipino soldier. I can train the Philippine army such that when you are independent, you don't have to worry. But see, for all of MacArthur's genius, fine, I'll use the word, for all his skill as a military man, as a politician, Douglas MacArthur, uh, perhaps one of his major quirks was Douglas MacArthur believes first and foremost in Douglas MacArthur. And therefore, anything that comes out of his mind will work. So he told Quezon, oh, this is what we're going to do, huh? We're going to train X number of Philippine soldiers. We're going to give them six months of training. We're going to train them in equipment. We're going to show that we can defend this country, right? MacArthur's defense plan was not realistic. Six months training is not sufficient to train a soldier properly. It does not help if there are not enough real equipment to use. It does not help that, and this might be hard to swallow, so actually a lot of the Philippine soldiers were illiterate. So it was very hard to train them. And many Philippine soldiers spoke different languages. Uh, we like to think that the ordinary Filipinos spoke English, but actually American officers would later say, the six month trained Philippine soldier is good in two things. He's very good in saluting, and very good in demanding three square meals a day. They could not really use equipment. They could not really maneuver information because they had not really trained properly. Okay? And they had not really understood what is real fighting all about. 
Okay? MacArthur said, I don't really need that many planes. I don't really need that many boats. We can defend. And Quezon, because Quezon believed MacArthur, and remember, they, they are actually not just friends, but Ninong, okay? To the other, to the other's child, Quezon said, I believe you, Douglas. Don't worry about it. So even when war began to appear on the horizon in Europe in the 1930s and finally erupted in 1939, Philippines were fascinated by the war in Europe. They said, oh, mystery. That's so cool. The ordinary Filipinos said, what the Germans are doing in Europe is way more interesting and way more impressive than what Japan was doing in Manchuria, later China. The Filipino would say, I love seeing Panzers. I love seeing the Luftwaffe. I love seeing these U-boats. What Japan's doing in China, well, I am. So they were distracted by the war. They were distracted by a war, a continent away. They were distracted by the war, continent away. Did not really worry about a slow pace of preparation in their own backyard. And only really began to worry about what Japan was doing until 1941. When Japan occupied Indochina. If you look at this again, uh, Japanese expansion for Pearl Harbor, you will see first the taking of Manchuria, 31 32, and then the taking of major Chinese coastal cities in 1937 onwards, and finally taking of Indochina in 1940 41. Take note now that Japan was expanding slowly, and then it accelerates now in the 1930s. So even before World War I, they had Korea and Formosa. They were expanding in such a way as to slowly surround the Philippines on the one side. And actually, if you were an astute observer, you would have already surround the Philippines on the other side as well through all those islands. As I mentioned earlier, war plan orange is very unrealistic precisely because Japan had already taken all these islands and bases to the right side. Okay? So this is what was happening. As Japan began to expand south toward taking into China, the Americans and the British began to worry. The British worried about their own colonies, no? specifically Burma, specifically Malaya, where Singapore and Malaysia are today. The Dutch began to worry about the East Indies, and the Americans began to worry about their own Philippine colony. And this is where if you remember your high school history, if you remember your college history, is where America makes the controversial decision to start threatening Japan. We will cut off your oil. We will freeze your assets in the United States if you do not pull out into China. We do not pull out of China. So Japan, being Japan, what the Japanese military said, we cannot accept a pull out from China. We have been there too long. We have lost too many men. And it would be a great humiliation to pull out. In the same way, they said, how are we to accept this threat from the West? Why should we be bullied into pulling out of Indochina? Japan would say, if France has the right to have colonies in South Asia, why not us? But the Americans insisted, no, you have to pull out. And this is where Japan, as early as September 1941, made a decision that if diplomacy does not work, we will go to war. If we cannot take or we cannot no longer buy oil from the United States, which we need for not just for our military, but all our industries, we will take the oil of Dutch East Indies. And not just that, we will take all those important resources in Southeast Asia copper, tin, rubber, and yes. Oil. Okay, so the plan was conceptualized in September 1941 to move south in case there is a failure of negotiation. And whether we like it or not, the Philippines happened to be in the way of that plan to move south. Okay, so this is the plan of the Japanese. You look at the big plan. The idea was to create a boundary to take enough territory in Southeast Asia, so it would be self-sufficient, and to create a defensive barrier to keep the Americans out, not to keep the Americans from ever being able to come to the rescue of all of those 
Southeast Asian colonies to, de to deter them, to scare America, to show you don't want to come here anymore. And of course, part of that plan was if you want to take America out of the equation, you have to attack Pearl Harbor. So this is the plan. No? Japan raised an army in Manchuria, an army in China, and now it will now it will spread its military tentacles to Southeast Asia over a six over a four month timetable. What was the defense of the Philippines like? MacArthur told Quezon by April 1942, I will be fully ready. I will have a very large Filipino army. I will have equipment and I will be ready to defend the beaches. Notice MacArthur said, I can defend the beaches. We do not need to do world war plan orange. MacArthur said, that's a defeatist plan. War plan orange is discouraging. Why would you want to be defensive? I want to show you, Quezon, the Filipino people and the soldiers themselves, we are good enough to defend our coastline. So MacArthur put the majority of his men in Luzon, okay? And he prepared defensive positions at the beaches and put a lot of supplies near the beaches. His logic was, why put the supplies farther back? No, put them at the beaches. We will defend the beaches, logically. We put our supplies near the beaches. But the great majority of his men, 70% of the Philippine army, okay, and American soldiers also in the Philippines are in Luzon. And the remaining 30% are scattered throughout Visayas and Mindanao. Okay, so you can see the disposition of US Army forces on 6 December 1941, day before Pearl Harbor. Here's an aerial view of the American Naval Base. Uh, to those of you old enough, you will think of Subic Naval Base as the main American base before World War II. Actually, it was not. It was Cavite Navy Yard, not Subic. Okay, so it's Cavite Navy Yard, which well, is now Sangley Point to us. This is a nice view. Uh, I've had students, they say, sir, is that uh, Manila Bay? Uh, yeah, but that picture is not from Manila. This is actually a picture of Corregidor, the Corregidor Golf Course, looking out to Bataan. So this can give you an idea of how close Corregidor Island actually is to Bataan. You can swim across it in a few hours, right? Here's an aerial view of Clark Air Base. It's still at least Clark Air Base still stands, now a, an international hub. So here is Clark. So there were still American military facilities because under the Commonwealth Agreement United States, American soldiers would continue to defend the Philippines alongside the Philippine Army until Philippines gains independence. So yes, there were Americans in the Philippines at the time of Pearl Harbor. I think the number would be something like 15,000, 20,000, right? But their equipment was inadequate. And many of these people made, were actually not as well trained as the ones who would later become part of the American army after Pearl Harbor. Did MacArthur have modern equipment? The American Air Force in the Philippines actually had some pretty modern planes. Actually, they had more modern planes than there were in Pearl Harbor. These are American B-17 bombers based in Clark. These are American P-40 fighters. They're actually better than many of the ones in Pearl Harbor, right? And these are, of course, Philippine soldiers. Semper Recreation Lantona. This is what Philippine military uniforms look like before when World War One, World War II broke up. Take note that the helmets are of World War I design. The boots are of World War I design. Actually, the uniform itself. It's World War I design. What does that tell you? It shows you that not only were Filipino soldiers equipped uh, wearing the uniforms of World War I, but their equipment was vintage World War I. And when we say it's vintage World War I, it literally means dating from World War I. And you don't have to be a chemist or a physicist to understand that if that equipment like gunpowder, like ammunition, like mortars, like grenades are at the very least 20 years old, their effectiveness once war breaks out in 1941 is highly questionable. So not only is the average Philippine soldier poorly trained, 
he is poorly armed. This is not to take away anything from the courage of the ordinary Filipino, but it is nevertheless showing a very low starting point in combat effectivity for the ordinary Filipino with war about to break out. So here are Philippine soldiers training with an anti-tank gun. These are Philippine scouts. So this is an all, uh, a largely all Philippine unit, but in this part of the American army, not the Philippine army. These guys are trained. They're very well trained. They knew how to use good equipment. But those in the regular Philippine army, the ones MacArthur trained, often used brooms or other makeshift devices to train. Many of them, when the war broke out, actually never fired a gun in anger, or worse, had never had a gun fired at them. So in other words, they had zero combat experience in terms of using their equipment and in terms of actually being under fire. And please keep in mind that for many soldiers with no training whatsoever, many will break once they are the ones on the receiving end of gunfire. Okay? Did the Philippines have its own Air Force? Yeah. This is what they call a P-26. Um, those of you who have ever played, what's that game? Oh, ah, yeah, Plants vs. Zombies. In Plants vs. Zombies, there's this thing called the pea shooter. This is what they call the P-26 pea shooter. It's if the Americans had more modern planes, like what are called the P-35 and the P-40, what the Philippine Air Force had were P-26s. Uh, FYI, the higher the number, that means the more modern or the later the model. So P-26s are really old. They're open cockpit. They're fixed wheel. In other words, these wheels don't fold. In fact, you even see the you even see the wires connect from the, from the side of the plane to the wings. No? These things were slow and very poorly armed. Kumbaga sa pea shooters, sa print, sa plaster zombies, pea shooters don't do much. Neither does this pea shooter. And that is what men like Jesus Villamor, for whom Villamor Airbus has been named, were given to fly. So not just on the ground, but even in the air, were Philippine equipment inadequate okay in comparison the japanese were going to invade the philippines these guys knew what they were doing for many of the japanese they had been fighting since 1931 or at the very least 1937 these guys were combat veterans they knew what to do they knew how to work as a team and the ordinary japanese soldier remember is trained is like it's trained though but it is part of his mindset to be willing to die in combat. To the Japanese, surrender is not an option. And to die for the emperor is the highest honor. Okay? So we, Filipinos, and the Americans who were here, were about to hit, be hit by the Japanese juggernaut. Even if, say, Filipinos look down on them, now ah, they're not good the Germans. That does not reduce the respect and the capability of the Japanese any point at all, right? Because look at this. To the Japanese society, militarism is normal. But even among civilians, huh? the idea of the war, that war is real, that difficulty in war, losses in war is acceptable, it's part of it. It has been part of their culture. So the parades, the equipment, and the eagerness to join battle, that was part of their culture. Compared to the ordinary Philippine soldier, no training, to the ordinary Philippine government official who would always say, well, the Americans will protect us, or yeah, we have our own army. It does not quite match up to the invading force. Or if you want, the invading culture that was to come to us in December of 1941. So here, for example, no, these are Japanese, no, you see, I'm not quite sure Shinto or Buddhist, and Japanese soldiers and civilians, they were trained in what if there's a gas attack? What if we are bombed? What if we are attacked? To the Japanese civilian, and much more the, the soldier, training is something taken very seriously. We know how to go to, they knew how to go to shelters, the bomb shelters. They knew how to react in a disciplined, organized manner. The Philippine government did not really prepare 
for war early enough. So for example, Kazon and the government say, okay, we have to practice uh, blackout. We have to practice evacuation. We have to practice running to shelters. But the problem was the preparations were slow. And to my goodness, it was not something taken very seriously because it's denial. It's illusion. The belief was even if war comes to us, it's not going to be that bad. We can always call it America and so forth and so on. Again, you can see the, the painful contrast between us, the defenders, and those who are about to invade us, among many other people that are going to invade. Here's another example. That this one's called a Japanese zero. Uh, actually, the Japanese call it Zeke, but the America, uh, the Japanese call it, uh, Americans call it zero. This is one of the best fighter planes of World War II. Many American pilots were to die quickly in the first year or two of the war because they could not get into their heads that the Japanese plane is better than theirs. It is faster, it is more maneuverable, and the pilots are very well versed in how to use their aircraft, how to use training. In fact, later on, when bombs began to fall in Manila, or when American planes would tangle with Japanese planes in the skies, many Americans would say, these are Japanese, those are Germans, those are German planes. This gross underestimation of the Japanese fighting man would prove to be tragic and fatal for many American and Philippine soldiers when the war would open. Okay? Here, the advent of war. This is where we talk about the 80th anniversary. We know what happened Pearl Harbor when the American fleet was caught by surprise. And precisely because the American fleet was caught by surprise, you would think that MacArthur and his men in the Philippines, who got the word early enough that Pearl Harbor had been bombed, Pearl Harbor, there's an area of Pearl Harbor, there's no drill, you would think that MacArthur and his men would have the common sense if you've already been if it's already been this terrible disaster for Pearl Harbor you'll be ready for another one you would have your air force prepared you would not be caught on the ground in fact because the first overt act has already been committed against American forces therefore you have every reason to hit the Japanese first you cannot say Oh, they have attacked us. Wag muna, wag muna. We might provoke them. The fact is, there already has been a provocation. Okay? And uh, perhaps a little known matter of military history a few hours before Pearl Harbor was bombed, some Japanese invaders were actually ahead of schedule and had already landed okay, in Malaya a few hours before Pearl Harbor. So actually, it's a in. So Pearl Harbor is attacked, Pearl Harbor is bombed. And yet, Douglas MacArthur has the incredible, how do I, I'm trying to be polite, has the incredible lack of foresight to be prepared for the Japanese to attack him. Perhaps, no, up to a point, you can't blame completely because there was only one working radar in the Philippines the whole time when the war began. There's only one at Iba Field in Zambales. There is none in Clark Field none in Nielsen field, none in any of the other fields in the zone. And when the Japanese bombers finally began to start arriving over the Philippines, when the radar at Iba actually picked up the Japanese for whatever reason, for whatever reason, when Iba people were trying to communicate to Clark, nobody in Clark responded. Or if someone did respond, say, yeah, 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 we'll pass on. And it was never was. So American planes were likewise caught on the ground. It was another Pearl Harbor. Okay, In fact, hours before the second Pearl Harbor over Clark and all the American bases, the American general in command of the Air Force had already been begging MacArthur, Mar General, sir, can we please bomb Formosa, what is now Taiwan? Because we know the jobs are going to come from there. Can we bomb Formosa? But from, from MacArthur's headquarters, orders are go, no, do not provoke them. I hope you understand how ridiculous that is now. We've already been bombed Pearl Harbor, and here is MacArthur's chief staff saying, Dey, wala, wala, chill ka lang. 
until it is too late. Okay, so here is Oahu bombed by Japanese planes. Uh, obviously, it was not six known dead. The casualties numbered in thousands after all the dust had settled in Pearl Harbor and in Honolulu. Okay, let's look at this map again. Look at the big picture. The idea is to establish a defensive perimeter. If you hit Pearl Harbor first, 4,000 miles away from, the, from Japan, okay, you will prevent or cripple or not only cripple Americans, but even if they put another fleet together, dissuade them from getting past that defensive perimeter. And notice how far away the Philippines is in that perimeter. So when MacArthur's Air Force caught on the ground, right? That has crippled MacArthur's striking force, the ability to fight back from the air and to defend from any future attack. Not to defend, but to spot any future attacks coming in. Okay? Look at this. This is the bombing of Camp John Hay shortly after the war began, right? This is the bombing of Cavite Navy Yard. A lot even without an air force, you wouldn't think that anti-aircraft guns could be fired at the Japanese. And they were. American anti-aircraft guns in Cavite Navy Yard were directed upwards to fire at the flying Japanese. A lot of the ammunition had not had been in box for 20 years and simply evaporated, disintegrated. And others simply did not fire. They were duds. And bottom line, uh, disintegrated duds or simply could not reach the altitude of the Japanese bombers. These anti-aircraft guns were simply inadequate for the job. So Cavite Navy Yard is destroyed. And in effect, MacArthur saw not just his Air Force, but his ability of this small Navy to fight back as well. So it really, really bad, it, not just in the first few days, and it's about to get much worse. Okay, the Japanese start landing. We normally think of the big Japanese landing in Lingayen Gulf. Actually, there's a good number of more. Okay, so there are attacks, uh, small force landing in Holo, some in Davao, which is a large Japanese community, uh, in Legaspi, in Vigan, in Apari, and in Batan Island up north. Okay, the big attack is still to come. Are the Americans able to throw the Japanese off at the beaches? No, either they're not there. Okay, the Philippine Americans are not there. Understand? There's only so much, so many men to de to defend so many beaches in the Philippines, or the small detachments based on the beach retreat. Some are brave; they fight back, but by and large, they're swept aside by the Japanese. But it's still not the main attack. Still not. The main landing will be on December twenty-two. There's, there's, there's General Masahara Homa landing at Lingen. Uh, to the credit of what is left of MacArthur's Air Force, some of the bombers tried, the remaining bombers tried to attack the transports at Lingen. They miss. Why? They're flying too high. They can't hit. American submarines are now sent in. Because although American surface ships have been told to flee to Borneo, okay, or even further south, American submarines enter Lingen Gulf and try to sink the transports. One is sunk, but the great majority of American torpedoes fired at Japanese ships, they malfunction. How can you possibly go wrong? Uh, they go under, they, when we, for example, when you target an American ship, uh, Japanese ship, a torpedo is supposed to hit below the waterline, right? So the part, the hull of the ship below the waterline. Practically all the torpedoes malfunction. That is, they, yes, they're underwater, but anything, for example, you set at a certain depth, it, the torpedo malfunction automatically adds maybe 10 feet more. In other words, it passes harmlessly under the Japanese ship. Okay? So not for lack of courage are American submarines trying to attack the Japanese, but the equipment that they have simply does not work. It did not help that to begin with, due to torpedo shortage, American sub submarines were not were told to not waste torpedoes in training. So they actually did not know that their torpedoes were, def were defective until it was too late. 
So the Japanese are landing in Lingay in the one impressive position because even as they land, there are no Filipino Americans there to oppose them because the Filipino Americans were at the wrong part of Lingayan Gulf, right? So here they start biking in the same way that the Japanese had biked their way from the border of Malaya and Thailand to Singapore, many of them are now biking their way to Manila. Okay? If you're the only Filipino, you start laughing, they're on bikes. Yeah, but see, the idea of the, the Japanese bike means they can keep moving. They can keep moving. In fact, in many cases, in Japanese rubber tire brakes, they still keep going on the rims of their bicycles. Right? So this is the way it works. Huh? MacArthur realizes too late that he cannot defend the beaches. He simply can't. So he finally orders WPO to be operational, right? Short before, before Christmas, MacArthur realized there is no way he can stop the main landing, no way from stopping all these Japanese units moving south to come to Manila. So he says, all right, we retreat to Bataan and declare Manila an open city. To those of you not well versed in the term open city, it means that you are pulling all military equipment and personnel out of the city in such a way that it is no longer a military target, okay? And therefore should not be attacked or bombed by enemy planes. That's under the international rules of war. The Japanese ignored it and continued to bomb anyway. But because MacArthur had ordered the retreat so late, okay? The problem with the USAFE, now called the United States Army Forces in the Far East, the problem with the USAFE, between the Bataan, a lot of their equipment, a lot of their supplies are going to be abandoned near the beaches. Because MacArthur had said WPO3 is not worth it. It should not be followed. He could no longer pull all the supplies that would have allowed these men to last for six months in Bataan until reinforcements come. So there was inadequate supplies in Bataan. It did not help that Manuel Quezon further complicated the issue. Uh, Quezon said, uh, rice in Nueva Ecija, in Cabantuan, the rice capital of the Philippines, Rice in Kabantuan that could have fed the Bataan defenders for many months, Kezon said, do not touch it. That is for civilians. So even when the American officers were, went to Kabantuan and said, can you please take the rice? We need that very badly if you want to survive. The government official said no, and MacArthur complied with Kezon's request. So right there and then, there is a food shortage in Bataan. There's equipment shortage in Bataan. There is a general inability from the very beginning to survive for long in Bataan. So even if, say, the Americans are able to retreat, so an incredible miracle, their forces are largely intact in Luzon. The ones coming up from Bicol, coming from the north, are able to stream into Bataan. So artillery comes in, tanks come in, cavalry comes into Bataan. But the rest of what the men need, it's not there. The basis for a stable long-term defense is simply not there. What are we referring to? Food, okay? An ordinary soldier would need perhaps 3,000, 4,000 calories a day. When MacArthur was able to take stock of all the men and all the equipment he had in Bataan, no, he realized that's not enough. So on day one, he ordered the men to be put on what is called half ration. So instead of what you normally need in a day to preserve the food, half ration. But what this food was missing? A lot of ammunition was left behind. And more than ammunition, more than food, what do you need? Medicine. A lot of the medicines left behind. Blankets were left behind. Even basic clothing was left behind. It got to a ridiculous point that Americans and Filipino officers had to go to department stores simply to buy socks and underwear for their men in the very hectic 
frenzied days before the retreat to Bataan. Kanya-kanya, in other words. So they not only lack food, they lack clothing, they lack medicine. Bataan, if you've ever been there, uh, is primarily uh, mountain, forest, and swamp. It is not a place to be in camping for six months. Okay, sana, as I said earlier, if MacArthur had prepared, in other words, set up barracks, set up enough structures, enough shelters beforehand, but there was none. There was none, except rudimentary, rudimentary buildings and rudimentary hospital. But there was no real preparation. So they were lacking medicine, okay, which were very needed in a very mosquito-infested area, and they lacked kulambo, the mosquito nets, lack base hospital equipment, right? This is going to be, from the very start, a fatal defense. What does it look like? The initial defense of Bataan, you can see it here on this map. No? Uh, I, I, I really want I, want, I don't want to go into strong military terms here. The initial defense of Bataan, uh, you can see it here, those two lines there. On the top, most of the, there's the left side and the right side where it says the main battle position. In theory, the Americans and the Philippines are now prepared. They have had a few week, a week or two to put up some defense and to regroup and to regain their morale after the retreat to Bataan. But you notice there's a, there's a middle, there's a big gap where those lines are. Between the left side and the right side of the defense is a mountain. Americans and Philippines said, Nobody would be crazy enough to go through that mountain, to go over that mountain. But that kind of attitude is the same fatal flaw when Germans fought the French or later the Japanese fought the British. The belief that it can't be done. To the Japanese soldier, remember, the idea of it can't be done does not really exist. So the, the Japanese are able to push forward. They're able to break through the lines on the left and the right by going over the mountain, by finding cracks in the American defense and the Philippine defense. To the credit, again, the Filipinos and the Americans, they fought hard. But the Japanese are able to outsmart them, to outmaneuver them in such a way as to, after a few weeks of very hard fighting, okay, and at some point the Japanese are actually pushed back a little, they end up retreating some more. Okay? Here are examples of defenses of the Americans and the Philippines. So you put up things on the few roads in Bataan to prevent trucks, prevent tanks from moving forward, but these will not last for long, right? So you hear a soldiers preparing for battle, for, their, for assembly, for checking up, how are you guys doing, and so forth and so on, right? There's Douglas MacArthur on the right, and there's Jonathan Wainwright, the man who will be left to command the Philippines, and MacArthur will evacu be evacuated in March 1942. Douglas MacArthur is seen in his picture in the one time he went from Corregidor to Bataan. Uh, Jonathan Wainwright was very respected by his men, whether Filipino or American, because even when the Japanese are firing at it, he could make an effort to just keep standing, to keep himself visible. And when his men would ask, sir, what are you doing? You could get killed. Wainwright would say, we have nothing else to give. We lack equipment, we lack food, we lack medicine. The last thing we can give is courage. And I will show what courage is. MacArthur went from Corregidor to Bataan only once. And although the Philippines continued to respect him almost to the bitter end, the ordinary American soldier would later look at him and call him dug out dog because he seemed to be dug out in Corregidor and lacked courage. Okay. As the, as the battle drew on, as the struggle in Bataan drew on, the Japanese would draw, would draw things like this, no? propaganda, don't wait to die. So these are examples of the Japanese trying to convince the Filipinos, do you really want this to continue when you could be with a woman? Okay. And the, as the battle wages on, actually, if you want to understand how the, 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 how the Bataan campaign went, the main fights were in... January and February. Towards the second half of February and the whole of March, the Japanese army was actually so worn out. So 
by February, the new American line was actually south. They had lost that the first line, okay, the January line, and now had moved further back to the February line. The Japanese were so tired by February and actually outnumbered. Uh, it is a little known fact of military history that the whole time in the campaign in Bataan, the Americans and Filipinos outnumbered the Japanese. Okay? In sheer number, they outnumbered the Japanese. But as the campaign drew on, and especially in late Feb and March, where the Japanese actually stopped advancing because they themselves were so few, and so many of them were sick of malaria and beriberi and dysentery, all sorts of tropical disease, that one had some observer said, you know, if MacArthur's men actually wanted, they could have pushed back out of Bataan in March and returned to Manila. But because the American soldier and the Filipino soldier were so sick, literally sick from lack of medicine and lack of proper treatment and lack of food, okay, as the food supplies dwindled and as the medicine dwindled, the ordinary soldier could not do much other than simply stay where he was. There was no longer the physical capability of the Philippine soldier to resist invasion. Oh, sorry, to resist or to do more than simply stay put. There was no capability to take an offensive, no capability to really be aggressive. Right? So throughout March, General Homa, who actually was a very humane person, no? Mong Arthur would later portray Homa as a butcher and the plan of the Bataan Death March. Homa was a very humane man. Homa swallowed his pride in late Feb and told Tokyo, we are behind schedule. Can you please send reinforcements? So throughout March, it became a terrible battle of attrition as the Filipinos and Americans waited for reinforcements were not coming despite the best promises of Washington, D.C. So Kessons evacuated in February, MacArthur evacuated in March, until it came to a point where in, on Good Friday of April, the Japanese are able to launch a major offensive. And there is practically nothing that the Americans and the Philippines and Bataan can do. The guy second from the left is General Edward King. He is now the commander of Bataan because what Wainwright has been promoted and relocated to Corridor. Edward King, on his own initiative, orders a surrender of 65,000 Americans and Filipinos and Japanese because he cannot resist. He cannot fight back anymore. His men can no longer put up any kind of credible defense without losing even more casualties. I think the whole thing can be captured best in the American officer to King's left. The one who can no longer oh, uh, cover his eyes. Kaya nga, earlier, as you saw here, it's but not in shame. Okay? Here are Japanese soldiers celebrating their victory over Bataan on April 9. Right? Well, it's now Avano Kagitingan. But for many of men, as you know, the struggle was not over. The terrible ordeal of surviving all those months without food, not medicine, this is not the end. We call it the Bataan Death March. No? The, the Bataan Death March, uh, it translates to 66 kilometers of walking, right? And then, or no, my, my bad, 66 miles or 110 kilometers. On average, it will go from five to 10 days. So it starts here in Mariveles at the tip of Bataan, right? The march in the, the dotted line will end in San Fernando. From San Fernando to Capas Tablac, they are boarded on trains. But these are not passenger trains. These are trains for cattle or perhaps for cargo. In other words, there are no windows, right? So these are hungry, sick, morally exhausted men marching 110 kilometers, boarding trains where it's so hard to breathe, and finally marching the last 11 kilometers from Kapas, the new to Camp Odal. What's the Bataan Death March like? Uh, well, there is no way to say it, but 
under but recognize the ordeal where in all of these men are forced to march starving and sick where so many should be dropped by the side, drop off side of the road the it is called the march of death just march not just because people died because they were sick could not go on but also because many of the japanese soldiers treated both filipinos and especially americans very badly right many japanese punished Philippines or Americans were caught with anything that was Japanese. So you would assume it's from a dead Japanese. And sometimes it wasn't even anybody who did anything terrible. Because a Japanese soldier is trained to never surrender. For me, they could not understand why did these Filipinos surrender? What did they, why are they even surrendering? It's inconceivable. But because they have surrendered, precisely they have no shame. They are not human. They will not be treated as human beings. So that is the way they were uh, indoctrinated in the military. And therefore, what they got from their own officers, harsh treatment. In the Japanese army, corporal punch, corporal punch is very normal. They now dealt out to the prisoners. This is not to say that all Japanese were like that. There are actually many historical moments where in Japanese soldiers were kind to the prisoners, would allow them to get food from civilians, get water from streams, allow them to rest. And in some cases, Japanese officers actually punish their own men who mistreated soldiers, mistreated prisoners. There were many Japanese officers who would stop the beatings, but not enough. And please remember that from the very beginning, again, not a well-known historical fact, that the Japanese grossly miscalculated how many men they faced in Bataan. There were 65,000 men in Bataan. The Japanese thought there were 25,000. So from the very beginning, there was never enough transportation for the men to be brought all the way to Camp O'Donnell, much less than Fernando. And many of the trucks of Japanese were for the Japanese use in preparation for the attack on Corredor. So there was no deliberate plan to kill maltreat, mutilate all these men. So it was a terrible combination of training, the mindset of soldier, the lack of trucks to begin with, and also the mere fact that the Japanese not only said how many prisoners there would be, but the state of the prisoners. The Japanese did not realize how sick and emaciated the prisoners were, would be from the very beginning. The Japanese did not even know how starved they were, how in poor shape. So it's a, all that combination. Huh? It is not to uh, degrade, it, sorry, it's not to underplay what happened this March, but the factors were actually a combination. But at the end of the day, over 10,000 died along the way. Many escaped. To join the guerrillas, but many died along the way, whether it be marching in the trains or the horrors of Camp Odal, which will not be part of this talk anymore. Right? Okay. We now move on to the last part. Huh? Uh, I'm actually a little over time, so it, we, I will skip part of the, the tail end and simply go to Corregidor. Corregidor is shaped like a tadpole. It looks like this. If this Corregidor, and then there is Bataan at the tip. Corregidor, whoever holds Corregidor actually holds Manila Bay in the sense that Corregidor is equipped with modern artillery, or the phrase, is equipped with artillery to sink any ship that enters Manila Bay. So the Japanese, even if they were taken Bataan in April, still could not control Manila Bay, could not bring their ships into Manila Bay without risk of the, of the, ship, of the guns of Corregidor. Okay? But the Japanese also realized that although Corregidor is a very well-armed and well-stocked fortress in the water, okay, here's a view of Corregidor during the war itself, right? And there's a tunnel underneath, Malinta Tunnel, which still stands today, can hold 10,000 men safely and protected from bombs, okay? Corregidor was designed before World War I before the advent of air power, 
Okay, so yes, there are safe hospitals, but uh, the guns of Corridor, I'll jump ahead, are not immune to air attack. They are not protected from, they can be protected from ships and are very useful if they are going to resist invaders on Corridor itself. But they could not protect themselves against Japanese bombers flying right, which is what the Japanese began to do. They began to bombard Corridor from the air and from Bataan. Such that Corridor's guns normally immune okay, from any attack are now clear targets from the Japanese and started wiping out one by one. So the Japanese did land in May. They could not be stopped. Even if the defense corridor fought very hard for the next few hours, once tanks arrive in corridor, there is nothing to stop them. Nothing to stop more reinforcements from coming. So Wainwright now orders the surrender of corridor. But it is not as simple. Wainwright says, he tells the Japanese, tells Homa, I am surrendering Corridor, but I cannot accept or cannot order surrender of Visayas and Mindanao. Remember, although the Japanese are now landing in Visayas and Mindanao, they have still not defeated, really engaged the Americans and Philippines there. Wainwright insists, I will only surrender Corridor. Homa says, no, you have to surrender all. It's all or nothing. There's Wainwright on the left there. The, his nickname is Skinny. And I think you can take the idea why he was skinny. And there's Homa, the bullet-headed Japanese on the right. Homa tells Wainwright, you have to order the men in the size Mindanao to surrender as well. You cannot simply say, I am no longer their commander. I cannot tell them what to do. You must make them surrender. So Wainwright now orders the men in the Visayas Mindanao to surrender as well. For many of these Americans, Filipinos in Mindanao, they cannot accept the surrender. For many of the Filipinos and Americans, the idea is we haven't even fought. The Japanese have not even been defeated. Why should we surrender? But the way Wainwright appeals to the men down south, he, with, in, without saying it explicitly, Wainwright says, if we do not if you people down there do not surrender, my men will be in danger. My men are virtual hostages. Please surrender. So the Filipinos, well, the high-ranking American generals and the high-ranking officers, made them agree to surrender. And some Filipinos. But the majority of the men in the Visayas Mindanao say, we will not surrender. We will continue this struggle. So yes, organized resistance ends with the surrender of the men in Visayas Mindanao, but the guerrilla war will begin. In fact, it began even before May 1942. American soldiers who had not been able to go to Bataan in Luzon had already gone on, on to the guerrilla war. Many Filipinos in other parts of the Philippines had already begun the guerrilla war too. And now they are joined by American and Filipino soldiers in the Visayas Mindanao. The Philippines will be the largest guerrilla force against the Japanese outside of China in the Second World War. And when the, if the Japanese have thought that we can convince the Philippines to surrender, and we will show we will win the term is hearts and minds of the Filipinos, they proved, they saw too late, it was not possible. So yes, it will be darkness before the dawn, but the dawn would eventually come years after, but it would eventually 